give our kids a round of applause. Yeah. Oh, man, I got to tell you, uh, I've watched that video about 50 times in the past 48 hours. I just cannot get over that. Hey, listen, if you uh, are having a hard day, or you are frustrated at work, or you are stressed out about parenting and schools and all these kinds of things, I recommend that you just close your office door or go find a closet in your house and lock the door, hide away from your kids, and just watch Callaway there at the end. Just watch Callaway Merchant there at the end, and it will bring a smile and joy to your face. That video sort of there at the very end, tipped you off maybe a little bit about where we're going this morning. Uh, my name is John, by the way, and I'm one of the pastors here. If we've not met, um, look forward to meeting you um, and maybe, you know, half of your face. But anyway, uh, kids, as Chris said, we're going on a bit of a, of a quest today. You've got a treasure map in your stuff, kids. If you went by the kids' table, you've got a map. And we are going to be on a journey this morning. Really, this is for our, our kiddos, young and old, okay? There's a kid inside of all of us. We all, I think, love a quest and an adventure. And here's the deal. The thing that we're going to find today is something that we've all asked for. It's something that we've all wanted to discover. It's something that deep down we know that we need if we're going to find what our, our hearts, our souls really long for. We're back in the book of 1 Thessalonians this morning. And if you have a Bible, I'd invite you to go ahead and turn there to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Or if you are, um, you know, bringing a device with you, dial it up on your smartphone. However you want to follow along, the verses will be on the screen as well. We started this conversation, this study through this letter back in May, and then we had to push pause a couple of times throughout the summer to deal with things that, you know, were going on around us. But today we're going to wrap it up. And so I want to set the context for you just one last time. We decided to title this series, Be Not Moved. And that was from a line that the Apostle Paul wrote to his friends in Thessalonica, in 1 Thessalonians 3, 2. Paul wrote this. He said, we sent Timothy to you. See, Paul and Timothy and his companions had come to plant this church there. They had to be, uh, they had to leave. They got run out of town. They heard about some things that were going on back in Thessalonica in the church there. And so Paul sent Timothy back to them to establish them, to exhort them, to encourage them in their faith. He says this, so that no one be moved by these afflictions so that no one would be moved by all the things that are going on around them. And this young church had experienced a lot of affliction, a lot of hostility and persecution from the very beginning. You see, their lives had been radically transformed by Jesus. They had a new king. Jesus was now king, not just Caesar. They had a new purpose in their lives. They had a new way to conduct their businesses. They had a new way to parent and lead the next generation. They had a whole new worldview, and it was causing a stir in town. The Jews who lived there in Thessalonica, they weren't happy about it because they didn't think Jesus was the Messiah. And kids, you may remember last week we talked about uh, the anointing how David was anointed to be king. He was set apart by God, chosen for his purpose. Messiah means the anointed one, the one true king, we believe. That is Jesus. So the Jews weren't happy about Jesus being pronounced as king. The locals there weren't happy about it because it was messing up their status quo. Everything ran on a, on a system of, uh, of just a pantheon of gods and all kinds of temple worship, and it was a big, it was big business back in the day, not to mention that it was just going to cause an uproar with this new group of people, this thing called a, a church following this new way of Jesus. It's gonna, this is going to cause problems with the Roman authorities. And yet in the midst of all of this, this church was growing. 
word was spreading around the region there that this group of people were different, changing. And you know, we have experienced our own turbulent, chaotic days. This year and this pandemic, it's caused all kinds of stuff. It's caused all kinds of affliction and problems. There's all kinds of things that are now coming to the surface. We've got conspiracy theories running around all over social media. We got dividing lines drawn over masks and school options. We've got, oh yeah, an election coming up. There's a lot going on. If ever there was a time to run back to the gospel and anchor down, it's in this storm of a year. So my prayer continues to be that, why, that we would be a people who are not moved off course by all the things going on around us. So as we wrap this series today, we're going to see Paul giving this church in Thessalonica and us today a roadmap. It's a compass to help us chart a course out of the wilderness of confusion, out of the wilderness of depression and despair, out of the wilderness of criticism and comparison or apathy and anger. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says this, this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. What we're going to talk about today, what we're going to talk about representing in, in these three boxes, this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Again, something we've all wanted to know, this is it today. If you've been around church, these verses we're gonna look at might be a little bit familiar. And so these boxes are here to help us maybe perhaps gain some some new, fresh perspective on what we're going to read here. Kids, are you ready to follow along with your treasure maps? Yes? All right. Here's your first one. 1 Thessalonians 5.16 says this, Rejoice always. Rejoice always. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. You guys know that song? Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. Yes, two of you. I did this at my house last night at dinner. I was like, I was testing it out, you know, and, and on my kids. And I was like, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, and uh, I got three different answers. I got one said, amen. And I was like, okay. One said, woohoo. And then what did you say, Nora? What did you say? Oh, someone said, hooray. <laughs> rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, hooray. Yes, that's fine. Rejoice, rejoice always. Now, this word rejoice, it's a verb. It comes from the noun of joy. So basically what Paul is saying here is that he wants you to joy, to do joy. It means to celebrate. And this verb right here, it has this imperative mood. This is like a grammatic nerdy thing in the Greek language, but it basically means it's a command. It's in the imperative mood. It means it's a command, which means that you and I are commanded to rejoice. We're commanded to celebrate and do joy. Now, what kind of God would command people to be joyful? Hmm. How about a God who is joyful. We've been created in his image. What he's calling us to is to become more like him as we follow him and obey his commands. God is a joyful God. Psalm 104 says that God rejoices in his works and all that he has made. God actually commanded his people, the chosen people of Israel, to gather at least three times a year just to throw a party, just to to celebrate and enjoy his goodness. There's something that happens in us when we celebrate. Even Jesus was full of joy. In fact, Jesus was actually accused of being a glutton and a drunkard. People just saw him and the way he lived and 
and they just accused him of being just, you know, too joyful. What's going on with you, Jesus? Remember the scene at the wedding when they ran out of wine and Jesus just made more. In John 15, Jesus told his disciples, I want my joy to be in you. And I want your joy to be full, to the fullest, to overflow and spill out. That's what Jesus wants for us. Now, where does that come from? Where does joy come from? Well, it comes from the Holy Spirit that lives within us. The Apostle Paul talked about this in his letter to the Galatians. You may remember the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. But how do we get that joy? When we're frustrated. Why don't I have that joy when I'm tired? Well, Paul said in that very same passage that we must walk by the Spirit. We must keep in step with the Spirit. What Paul is saying is that as we walk with God, as we develop a relationship with him, as we are, as Jake said, in his word, learning more about him and his way for our lives, as we keep in step with his spirit, we will experience the fruit of his spirit. And one of that is joy. Richard Foster is known for his classic book, Celebration of Discipline. He wrote it back in the 70s. It's still relevant today. In it, he said that celebration is a discipline. It's not something that just falls on our heads. It's the result of a consciously chosen way of thinking. My wife has a sticker on the back of her car that says, choose joy. We often think of joy as just this passive thing. We ought to just have it and carry it around with it. But the reality is we have to choose it sometimes, right? Sometimes it just doesn't come naturally out of us. We have to choose to set our minds on the things of God that would stir up rejoicing and celebration and joy inside of us. And when we do choose joy, it makes us strong. In the Old Testament, in the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah 8.10, Nehemiah was encouraging the people. They were all rebuilding the wall around the great city of Jerusalem. And Nehemiah said to them, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now, what would a follower of Jesus have to celebrate about? And what would we rejoice about in the middle of a pandemic? What do we rejoice about when margins are thin and stress is high and life is challenging and things are not as we're used to when plans change like that? Pick any promise from the Bible. Pick a truth from God's word. Start with the gospel about Jesus. How about this? I will never pay the full penalty for my sin. I will never endure the wrath of God because Jesus did that for me. The almighty God is for me, not against me. I'm part of a family the family of God. And I never have to be alone. For a child of God, there's always something worth celebrating. And therefore, there's always reason to throw a party. Let's see what I got in here. I've got all kinds of things in here. I forgot. Whoa! That's about what I thought. I messed this thing up earlier when I put it in the box. There's always reason to throw a party and turn on a karaoke microphone and, uh, and, and, and just rejoice to dance a little bit, as Knox shows, uh, showed us a minute ago on that video, right? Yeah. Rock on, buddy. Yes. There's always reason to rejoice for the child of God, for we have been rescued and saved. We have hope and purpose. We are loved no matter what we've done. As we sang earlier today, the never-ending, reckless love of God. 
We cannot earn it. We don't deserve it. He just gives it to us. We can rejoice. So, perhaps every day this week, you need to think about a time and an occasion to celebrate. Maybe it's at the end of the day at dinner time with your family and you pull out the you are special plate and you honor somebody for doing something epic that day. It doesn't have to be their birthday or a special holiday. Just have a big celebration at dinner. Maybe it's at breakfast or at lunch. Maybe it's just in the middle of the afternoon, you throw a little dance party because you know what? We just need to celebrate a little bit. We just need to rejoice. Paul goes on. He says, rejoice always. And then verse 17, he says, pray without ceasing. Pray without stopping. It could be translated, never stop praying. This is part of God's will for your life. And maybe you're hearing that and you're thinking, pray without stopping? How about just starting? (laughs) I don't know about you, but I'm not great in this area of my faith. I struggle to pray. My attention span is short. My, My mental fortitude is weak. I try to do things in my own strength. And Paul says, pray without ceasing. And when I hear that, a couple of mental pictures come to my mind, and I'll share them with you. Number one, I think Paul just wants us to be some kind of monk, right? He wants us to put like a big robe over our head, walk around in a monastery, and just chant things in Latin, right? Like, that's what he must be talking about, just to, you know, pray without ceasing, just walk around in some kind of trance-like state of prayer. Or... I think about maybe the other extreme, which is the crazy Irishman. Do you, anybody remember the crazy Irishman from uh, Braveheart? Uh, it's an old movie reference. But anyway, the crazy Irishman is always talking to God. He'll just, in the middle of a conversation, just stop and go, yes, Father. You know, like, like he's got a direct line to the Almighty, you know. And, uh, and maybe that's what Paul's talking about, that, that we can just walk and just have conversation and just blurt it out right in the middle of our day. Maybe this command feels like one of those extremes. Either a hermit locked in a prayer closet or a person who's just not quite right in the head. And there are a couple of ways to think about what Paul is saying right here. I'm gonna give you two things and I think that either of them can be right. First, speaking of monks, I wonder if you've ever heard of a guy named Brother Lawrence. Brother Lawrence, he's best known for a book called The Practice of the Presence of God. He was born in France around 1610, so the 17th century. He became a soldier. He fought in a war called the Thirty Years' War. He sustained an injury that almost killed him, left him crippled and in chronic pain for the rest of his life. And eventually, years later, after the war, he entered a monastery there in Paris. And for 15 years, he served in the kitchen. He cooked meals for the hundred plus members of their community and he washed ditches. And in the midst of the mundane chores of dishwashing, and eventually he would move to being a shoe repairman, he learned to just continually be aware that God is with him, to continue to practice the presence of God. I love what he writes in his book. He says, the time of busyness or business does not differ with me from the time of prayer. And in the noise and the clatter of my kitchen, while several persons are at the same time calling for different things, I possess God in his great tranquility as if I were on my knees. So praying without ceasing could simply mean to walk with and talk with God in the mundane things of your day. For Brother Lawrence, it was while he stood at the sink and he would wash the dishes, perhaps with a towel on his shoulder and a little bit of joy. I thought that was appropriate as he was washing dishes for others cleaning up their mess, he was aware that God was with him. 
How many times have you stood at the sink washing dishes, mind who knows where on who knows what, perhaps even frustrated that you're having to do it? Might this be a time when you could spend time with God, praying without ceasing, praying there in the midst of the mundane that God would meet you there? that God would meet the needs that you have. Or, you know, maybe it's just going for a walk. Maybe you just need to put your tennis shoes on and walk down your street and pray. Pray for your neighbors. Pray for your family. Pray for those things that have been worrying you throughout your days. To thank God for things that he's been doing in your life. To ask God to show you how he's moving and where he's working and how he wants to lead you. Praying without ceasing is bringing the conversation with your heavenly father into your everyday world. So look for times in your day to practice. Driving in your car, walking your dog, standing at the sink or at the stove, standing in line, to check out or sitting at a red light. Resist the urge to pick up your phone. God is with you. Talk to him. Bring him into each aspect of your thoughts and your cares. That's one way to think about this, a continual conversation. Here's another way that we could think about this, and it comes from a story that Jesus told. In Luke chapter 11, if you have a Bible and you want to flip over there, I'm just going to read this story. We won't unpack every detail of it, but I want to show you something interesting here. Jesus is teaching his disciples how to pray. They had asked Jesus, hey, teach us how to pray. And Jesus gave them the Lord's Prayer. And then in verse 5, he said this to them. He tells them a story. Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. Hospitality was a really big deal in this culture and it would have been really important for you to have something to serve someone who had been on a journey and was staying in your home. Verse seven, And he will answer, the friend inside will answer from within, do not bother me. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. Jesus said, I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. In other words, here's what I think Jesus is trying to say. Because this man keeps going to his neighbor's door and banging on it, being impudent even, which just means annoyingly bold. That's what it means, annoyingly bold bold. Jesus is saying, this this guy is just banging on the door saying, I've got to have bread because of his persistence, his impudence. The friend will finally open up and give him what he needs. I think Jesus is describing another way of praying without ceasing, a praying that doesn't give up, a praying that may have to be a little bit aggressive. I don't think this works with the mask on. But you get the idea, right? Prayer that is aggressive, that is bold. God, I need this. Help me. Where are you? Look through the Psalms and see the prayers of David and the other psalmists when they cried out, where are you, God? How long, God? I need you, God. Pray without ceasing. Never give up. Never stop praying for your prodigal child. Don't stop praying for a breakthrough in your marriage. 
don't stop praying for more of the Holy Spirit in your life. Last one. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 18. Just to review, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Paul says, give thanks in all circumstances. Why? Two reasons. It gives God the glory, and it's good for you. James chapter 1 tells us that every good and perfect gift comes from our Father above. When we give him thanks, it gives him glory. Romans 8 tells us that God is working all things together for our good. That means that no matter what the circumstances are, whatever is happening around us, we can give thanks. I love how the message paraphrases Psalm 100, verse 4. It says this, enter God's presence with the password. Thank you. The password is thank you. I love that. What's the password to come into God's presence, kids? What is it? That's right. We often say, what's the magic word? It's please. Well, the password is thank you. I read an article in Forbes magazine. It's a secular article full of all kinds of different research studies on the power of gratitude. Listen to five things that happen when we give thanks. Number one, improved psychological health. Gratitude reduces a multitude of toxic emotions ranging from envy and resentment to frustration and regret. Number two, when we give thanks, we experience enhanced empathy and reduced aggression. According to a study at the University of Kentucky, participants who ranked higher on gratitude scales were less likely to retaliate against others. They experienced more sensitivity and empathy toward other people and a decreased desire to seek revenge. Number three, better sleep. When we're thankful, we sleep better. So just spend 15 minutes before bed jotting things down that you're thankful for. And of course, we're listening to that and we're like, nah, I'd rather scroll through my social media news feed and just swim around in that toxic mess, right? Maybe we would sleep better if we put that to the side and we began to think about all the things throughout our day that we can thank God for. Number four, improved self-esteem. Studies have shown that gratitude reduces social comparisons. Rather than becoming resentful toward people who have more money or better jobs, grateful people are able to appreciate other people's accomplishments. Number five, increased mental strength and resilience. They talk about a study in 2006 that they did with Vietnam War veterans, and they found that Higher levels of gratitude in these veterans led to lower rates of post-traumatic stress disorder. A similar study was done after 9-11, and they found that gratitude was a major factor in people's resilience, their ability to bounce back after that attack. So when I think of giving thanks, I think of thanksgiving, (laughs) right? I think of thanksgiving, and I... When I think of Thanksgiving, I think of a turkey. And so, kids, you've probably heard your teachers, and you're about to hear your teachers again tell you, whether it's your parents doing homeschool or your teachers online or in this building, they're going to tell you to put your thinking caps on. Well, I think sometimes we need to put our thinking caps on. Yeah, right? We need to put our thinking caps on. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And so maybe this week, what you need to do is you need to get out some stationery and you need to write some thank you notes. Maybe it's to to God in a journal. Maybe it's to someone that you know. You You just wanna thank them for being a friend. Thanks for being a friend. Is that a data reference? Golden Girls, anybody? Golden Girls, Chris, yeah? Uh Uh-huh. Blanche? Anyway, some of you are like, what? Uh, 
old TV show the, when you used to watch things on TV live on cable. Maybe you need to start your day by thinking about things that you're thankful for. I want to challenge you to perhaps take a card, a note card like this, and to write down three things that you're thankful for today. Thank God for those things as part of this continual conversation with him. Put it in your pocket and take off onto your day. And throughout your day, when you're at a red light or in a waiting room or, you know, sitting in your office, eating your lunch, whatever you may be doing, you pull this out and you think about three things that you're thankful for. Just be reminded of the good things that God has given you. I, I wrote down this morning, my truck. I was thanking God for my truck. It's not perfect, but I love that truck. And instead of being all frustrated with the things that are wrong with it, I was just thanking God for it. Many of you drove by it on your way up the hill because it ran out of gas. It's just, I'm a living sermon illustration, okay? I'm a living sermon illustration. So, so maybe that's what you need to do to remind yourself throughout the week that, that God is with you, that he is good, and you have a lot to be thankful for. Rejoice, pray, and give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So what? You know, this whole way of living is so alien to our culture. I still have my think thanking cap on. It's so alien to our culture, isn't it? We rush, 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 rush. We go, 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 go. We complain. We think about what's next or about what's not, what we don't have. We struggle with this. We need this kind of reminder. But do you know what else we need? We need this truth, but as Jake said it earlier in the announcements, we also need each other. We need the word of God and we need the people of God. And that is why the Apostle Paul wrote these commands to us using a plural form of the word you. We don't see that in our English Bible. Maybe it's you know, implied because we see you and we think he's writing to a church, he's writing to a big group of people. And so, so we understand that, but it was very specific in the original letter. He was, he was saying, you guys, or in other words, y'all. Paul was, was speaking Southern. He was saying, y'all, y'all rejoice. Y'all pray all the time. Y'all give thanks in every circumstance. Gather around and do this together. And I think that's really important for us to think about because we don't always do this well and we need others to help us. So if you're struggling, the, the idea of rejoicing and throwing a party and celebrating at this time in your life, in this season with all that you've going on, that seems really hard. And so you need to get around some people that will, that will bring life to your soul, that will help you to rejoice. That you just borrow some of that joy that they seem to have. You need to get around them. So there are people in this room, people that you know, that you live with, or you do life with that are so good at this. Get around them and let it rub off on you. Maybe you've prayed and you've prayed and you've prayed and you've tried to ask God for something and you don't feel like he's hearing you and you're just, you're spent, you're out of energy. Or maybe you just don't think you're good at this at all. Like, I, I just, I can't do that. Find someone who does pray and let them pray over you. Let them pray for you. Admit to them where you're struggling and, and come alongside them and join them in their prayers. I, I do so much better when I'm praying with other people. Maybe you're struggling with frustration or maybe you know someone who's struggling with frustration and you or someone else just needs to be reminded of all that there is to be thankful for. Giving thanks in all circumstances is something we can encourage one another with. As a child of God, there's always something to celebrate. 
Our Heavenly Father wants a relationship with us. That's why he commands us to pray all the time. And he gives us so many good things. And he calls us to thank him for that. For his glory and our good. Will you stand with me? I'm going to pray for us.